Well, we are currently going through a series on 1 Thessalonians. Now, the first letter of Thessalonians, if you were to sum it up, you would say it's all about living in hope. All about living in hope, especially during difficult times, which the Thessalonians, a very young church, just recently pioneered by Paul, were facing. And so Paul was speaking to them about hope. I'm going to read to you the whole of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And the title of my message today is Authentic Ministry. Authentic Ministry. As we read this passage together, you will see that Paul is having to defend his ministry and uh, his, how authentic he was as a minister of God. And during this passage, we find what it is to be an authentic minister of the Lord, but also what it is to be a fake minister of the Lord. So let's read together. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1, following NIV version. You know, brothers and sisters, that our visit to you was not without results. We had previously suffered and been treated outrageously in Philippi, as you know. But with the help of our God, we dared to tell you his gospel in the face of strong opposition. For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We're not trying to please people, but God who tests our hearts. You know we never use flattery, nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. We were not looking for praise from people, not from you or anyone else, even though, as apostles, we could have asserted our authority. Instead, we were like young children among you. Just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Surely you remember, brothers and sisters, our toil and our hardship. We worked night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preached the gospel of God to you. You are our witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. And we also thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as a human word, but as it actually is, the word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. For you, brothers and sisters, became imitators of God's churches in Judea, which are in Christ Jesus. You suffered from your own people the same things those churches suffered from the Jews, who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and also drove us out. They displease God and are hostile to everyone in their effort to keep us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. In this way, they always heap up their sins to the limit. The wrath of God has come upon them at last. But brothers and sisters, when we were orphaned by being separated from you for a short time, in person, not in thought, out of our intense longing, we made every effort to see you, for we wanted to come to you. Certainly I, Paul, did again and again, but Satan blocked our way. For what is our hope, our joy, or our crown, in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ when he comes? Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and joy. So in this passage, we find that Paul is telling them and reminding them and defending his authentic ministry as an authentic minister and leader in pioneering the church in Thessalonica. 
You know, if you're interested in the background to what Paul is saying here, you can read Acts chapter 16 and verse 17. Because here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 2, he talks about how he had previously suffered outrageously in their second missionary journey when they went to Philippi. You might remember the story, uh, people got saved, um, a, a, a uh, sorceress had, a, had her powers, her demonic powers cast out of her, and Paul and his uh, team were beaten up with sticks, thrown into a prison, but God came through and delivered them, and the jailer got saved, and then they got uh, kicked out of the city. And as they moved on, they came to Thessalonica, there in Acts 16, 17, where he's writing to. When they got there, again, many people became Christians, but again, people, the Jews that didn't accept Christ, stirred up the people against them, and very quickly they had to move on from this young church. But he begins in this chapter by saying, hey, you know, our ministry without ministry and our short visit to you was not without results. God had used them to pioneer a church that would grow very strong, even though they could only be with them for a short time. And then he begins to describe his ministry to them. And in this passage, we can find out what it means to be an authentic leader for Christ, an authentic minister for Christ at every different level. But also he shows what it is to be an unauthentic or a fake minister or Christian leader for Christ. So in this passage, this should help us discern good ministers, good leaders, good pastors from bad, but also this should be something that speaks to us as we grow in in our Christian lives and hopefully into different levels of Christian leadership, that we will say, what do you want me to be as a leader? And what don't you want me to be as a leader? So here, he begins to speak about how they had boldness and that they dared in opposition, in verse 2, to preach the gospel in the face of great opposition. Straight away, we find something about a Christian leader or an or authentic ministry. And that is that we preach God's truth even when people don't like it. Even when the society doesn't like our message, we preach God's truth. We don't change our message, we don't change our teaching, we don't change God's truth to keep society happy. We don't try and find some middle way, but we preach God's word no matter the response to it, whether it's favorable or unfavorable. That doesn't mean that we go out of our way to be offensive. On the contrary, we as ministers, we as Christians, should be the least offensive we can in our attitude, our style, the way we speak to people, the way we treat people, should be seasoned with great respect, even if we disagree with them, great love and great service, like servants to the world. Let the message offend if anything's going to be offensive. And sometimes inauthentic Christian Christians and inauthentic Christian ministers and preachers almost set out in their style or the way that they preach God's word to purposely be offensive. That's not the way that we should be. The gospel is offensive enough. But neither should we change our teaching on such things as morality on such things as gender, as such things on, uh, on marriage and many other things that are in the Bible. On the contrary, in love and with patience, we should speak these things with clarity because the things that are offensive to this generation that they want us to keep quiet about are exactly the very things that they need to hear even though they may not like it and want to shut us up. Too many churches today shy away from speaking in love and kindness about the very topics that the world is telling us to shut up about. Not that we should try and make enemies, but we need to speak God's truth. 
Paul spoke God's truth, and many people benefited from it, but also many people hated it, and he even got beaten up because of it, but he never changed the truth spoken in love. He says also in verse 3 that our appeal to you, our message, does not come from er error, impure motives, or trying to trick you. At this time in um, the ancient world, there were many different philosophies, many different religious views, and people would come into the different cities with the latest religious fad or, or, st or strange philosophy. And uh, they would make their living by trying to recruit people to their religion or version of philosophy. Because as they recruited these people, these people would then fund them, would then pay them a salary, would, 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 would give them money. And so Paul is very strong about this and says, look, when we come to you, we don't come with, immature, with impure motives. We're not coming to you to get what we can out of you. We're not using this message that we preach for our own gain, in order to get your applause, I'll mention this in a, in a moment, or to get your money, or, or to get anything from you. We're not here with impure motives, and we're not trying to trick you into uh, being our servants and following us as your religious masters or gurus. He says, that on the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, and we're not trying to please people. So here, Paul's motivation wasn't what he could get out of people that he was ministering or leading or, or sharing the gospel with, um, but his motivation was the approval of God. At the heart of all our lives, in whatever level of Christian leadership or Christianity we are, our main motivation should be, does this please God? Does this approve, is God approving of, of this? I remember once preaching a message, it's a title that's used by many people, and the message that I preached was called An Audience of One. And in that message, it was based on the Sermon on the Mount, and it spoke about, the Sermon on the Mount speaks about the Pharisees who did everything in front of people to get their respect, to get their honor, to get their uh, applause, to, to, to get their support. So when they prayed, they prayed in order that the people would clap and say, wow, what a spiritual man. When they fasted or did religious observances to sort of show that they were uh, radical followers of, of Yahweh. They did it so everybody would notice. When they gave to the church, they were like one of those companies that gives to charity. And although, thank God, they give to charity, they have one of those huge, big checks where they write the amount that they've so generously given and then they pose with the charity and, uh, uh, and the photo is taken, put on their website and their newsletter. They may be giving to charity but they're also doing something to show the world what a wonderful company that is. I'm not saying that's necessarily wrong but that's what the Pharisees were doing. But God said when you pray, go somewhere where nobody can see you. When you give, don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing. When you fast, appear like you've been feasting. And your Father in heaven, who sees what you do in secret, in other words, away from people, will reward you. And so Paul, in these passages, he says it a number of times, is saying we're not trying to please people, we're trying to please God. And as we please God, we will best minister to people. So in our workplaces, in our student places, in our social life, well, who are we trying to please first? Are we trying to please our friends and just go with the crowd? Are we trying to please society? Are we, are we trying to please others around us? Are the Christians to form a group that will become our followers? Or are we trying first in an audience of want to please God? There's a story about uh, a young uh, violinist, a young boy, uh, a prodigy, prodigy, a violinist, and he went to a, uh, a great, one of the great big theatres in New York to play. And he played, and at the end of this concert that was packed out, 
he had, am I doing it right, Faith? Am I doing it right? Can you recognize your voice? And at, at, the end, at the end of this concert, everybody stood up, they were applauding, and as he went out, the manager that was there in the wings said, go out and take a bow, take a bow again. And he said, no, no, I, I won't. He said, look, they're all standing, cheering, go out and take a bow. And the boy said, they're not all standing and cheering. Can you see right up in the corner, that man with grey hair and a beard. Can you see right up there, the man that's sitting while everybody's standing? And the manager said, yes. He said, that's my teacher. When he stands, I'll go out and take a bow. So with all those people there, the only person that that violinist really wanted to impress was his teacher, because he understood that his teacher was the one that understood. That's a lesson for us all at every moment of our lives in this coming week, when you decide what to say and what not to say, what to do and what not to do, your attitude, re your reaction. Um, what are you doing? First of all, please the one person that counts. That doesn't mean that, again, I'm going to say this again because there's plenty of, has anybody ever met a rude Christian? Wave at me. You're all liars. All right, three or four of them. I tell you, there's nothing ruder than a ruder Christian, than a rude Christian. Nothing ruder. Why? Because they tend to be self-righteous and pharisaic, pharisaical. We're not going out like this. I don't care if I have offended you. I'm not, I'm not here to please you. I'm here to please God. Well, God's not pleased with you because you're meant to love your neighbor and consider them. So um, just in case, I know we don't have anybody here in a manual that would be so rude, but this is going on the internet, so others from other churches might be looking at it that, that, that need it. And then, then he goes on with this other word. We're looking at, first, we're looking at the things that Paul says were not, so we can identify false ministry. Um, he says... Uh, you, in verse 5, you know we never use flattery, nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. I think this is very powerful when it comes to authentic Christianity, authentic Christian leadership, and authentic ministry. Flattery. Flattery is when you talk to people insincerely with the hope of using them or getting them to support your own personal concerns. And this can often take place in Christian churches where leaders flatter people, tell people what they like, make them, make them feel that they're special, but it's not true, it's not from the heart, it's flattery. It's order to win you to my side. It's order to make you stay in my group. It's, it's flattering you, it's saying nice things, but behind the flattery, and you're thinking, oh, that's nice to say, really there's a different motivation. I'm flattering you, I'm saying how wonderful you are, I'm giving you compliments, I'm saying all the things you want to hear, because in doing so, I have then recruited you and I can use you for my own ends. It's not just in Christian leadership, it's throughout that is throughout the world. Be, be, beware of flattery. Get to know someone so that when they give you a compliment, you know it's genuine because they're also prepared to, um, to give you correction. Give you correction. You know, if you find someone that you trust enough to allow correct, to, to correct you, you know, and to correct you for the right reasons for your own good, if you can find someone who you trust enough to correct you, for the right reasons, you've found gold. Because if someone's prepared to correct you for the right reasons, then when they compliment you, it will also be for the right reasons. That's authentic ministry. He said, we didn't put on a, a mask to cover up greed. And so this is another point of inauthentic ministry, false ministry, when the minister or the leader is out to get from those that he's leading. This can happen in small groups, this can happen in local churches, this can happen in parachurch ministries, where the ministry is, is far more interested in getting from those it's meant to be ministering to than giving to those that they're ministering to. There's nothing wrong in fundraising. The laws of sowing and reaping financially are correct in the Bible, but 
uh, far too often we find in the Western world that there is almost like a greed where ministers want to fleece the flock. They want to take everything that they've got in order to promote their own ministry. There is a mask of, of trying to twist people's arms to give, a mask trying to get people to support the ministry, masked in spirituality, but behind it is greed. Now, we spoke about people pleasing and all these things, and the final negative thing I want to address here before we go into some positive things is uh, in verse 6, he says, look, we were not looking for praise from people, though as apostles of Christ, we could have asserted our authority. Paul had incredible spiritual authority. I mean, he was commissioned by Jesus Christ himself personally on the road to Damascus. He had tremendous authority. I mean, in God and under the unction of God, he wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. Founded churches, moved in signs and wonders, apostolic doctrine. If anybody could have asserted God-given authority, not pretending authority, but God, genuine God-given authority, it was Paul. But look at him, he said, I could have asserted my authority with you, but I didn't. He wasn't authoritarian, even though he had authority. On the contrary, as you'll see in a moment, he treated those around him with family affection. Family affection. You know, an authentic ministry, an authentic minister, an authentic leader, an authentic Christian in any realm of authority within the church or in the workplace, an authentic Christian will never use authority for their own gain. In fact, they will try to use personal relationship and, and reason rather than authority. And when they have to use authority, and sometimes you do, they won't be happy about using it. They'll have think that something has failed in this situation that I have to exert my God-given authority. And to be honest, I have found that when you do have to resort to exerting your God-given authority as a Christian leader, normally the person isn't going to respect that anyway. If they don't respect your reason, if they don't respect your fellowship, then the chances are that when you speak to them with authority, they won't respect that at all. But there are ministries, and there is what we call heavy shepherding, where leaders are always telling those under them what they should be doing, what they should be wearing, what they should be eating, how they should be acting, always wanting more, 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 always invading in their lives, speaking into their lives, into areas that's got nothing to do with them. That was not Paul. He was not a heavy, oppressive, uh, in-your-face, all-the-time controlling leader, although he knew when he needed his authority to be used. So there's all the sort of negatives that we should, as Christians, make sure it isn't in our lives, but also be in a place where we can be discerning of Christian leaders and, and, and ministers. But what about something positive? Uh, he doesn't just talk about the negatives. He also speaks about the positive and, uh, ways and the, the positive marks of authentic ministry. And uh, we see this in verse 7. And what you'll see in, in this passage is that when Paul speaks about authentic ministry that comes from God and is pleasing to God and blesses God's people, uh, it is, it, it, he likens it to a family. And he uses every aspect of family to show what authentic ministry and authentic Christian ministry to one another is. In verse 7 he said, just having said, we didn't come to you with authority that we could have used, but instead we came to you like young children among you, just as a nursing mother cares for her children. So in other words, when they came, they came with an innocence and a childlikeness. 
Not, not, not in the sense of them not being mature or educated, but they, they came with an open heart. You know, the one thing that's wonderful about young children, when you observe them, or most of the time, I guess, is that they're, they're an open book. They're an open book. It takes a few years for a child to learn to put on a little bit of a mask. And so it's wonderful when you see young children and they just say what they think and their, their face is an open book. They're happy, they're sad. You, you can just read them. There's, there's a transparency to young children until they learn that sometimes they want to veil that for other reasons. And Paul said, we came to you like young children. We didn't come to you with, with cleverness or, or as adults, but we came to you open, innocent, transparent. This is so important for us as Christians and, and Christian ministry to be who we are on the inside. Now obviously you, you, you don't share everything with everybody all of the time, but there is a sense in which you can tell when someone's being authentic with you after a while. You, you're not wondering that, that on the platform say they're one thing, then off the platform they're another. You know, uh, Christian leaders that are angels on the platform, but in the church board they're like demons fighting amongst themselves. But a transparency, mistakes are there, good bits, bad bits, but you're open-hearted. Paul said we came to you like children, but then he says, and like a nursing mother that cares for her children. How lovely. This is authentic Christian ministry. When you are like a mother nursing her child, caring, looking after, nourishing that child with milk, wanting that child to be safe and healthy, and also wanting that child to grow bigger and bigger. Uh, Paul speaks about giving the milk of God's word to the Corinthians and that actually it was time for them to be weaned off that and get some stronger stuff. But the milk of God's word, what it is I guess to be a, a mother and you, you're nursing your child with the breast or with the bottle and you're wanting that child to put on weight, aren't you? You're wanting that child to grow beco and become stronger and stronger and stronger. This is what authentic Christian ministry is about. It's wanting to see people drink their milk and go stronger and stronger and stronger. I'm young enough, old enough, sorry, I wish I was young enough, I'm old enough to remember the free milk that we used to get at school when I was a youngster in a Church of England school in a village in um, the Yorkshire Dales until Margaret Thatcher took them away. Um, and we used to go out and the birds would would sometimes take the milk and in the cold it would be iced up and uh, in the warm it would be a little bit a bit creamy and we used to take that milk and we used to stick a straw in and we used to drink it because the government at the time wanted the children at school to be strong and all the good things that in milk that are in milk so when we're talking about being authentic it's about looking at others and saying how can I help them grow how can I help them be strong how can I help them become the best Christian version of themselves. Then he goes on and he says to them, surely in verse 9, surely you remember brothers and sisters are to toil and hardship. We work day and night in order not to be a burden to anyone. I like this because now he says we've spoken about children, we've spoken about mother, now authentic Christian minister is being a brother and a sister. In a family, a brother and a sister. You might have an elder brother and a younger sister or, or, or vice versa, but they are siblings. And so Paul said, we didn't come to you as authoritarian sort of Victorian style parents where you should be seen and not heard and obey our every word, but we also came to you as brothers and sisters, together, equal, sharing the load. In fact, in this new church, Paul could have said, okay, we're going to take up an offering for my ministry so I can study God's word. That did happen to the apostles in Jerusalem. They needed to be freed to do that. But he said, you know what, I'm going to go down the local tent market. I'm going to make tents because that's what I do. Oh, no, no, we'll, we'll look after you. No, 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 I'm going to share with you in this early time in the church. I'm going to be just like you. You're my brother. You're my sister. We're equal. And uh, it's not this hierarchy hierarchical thing. I know I'm an apostle, but I'm going to treat you like a brother and a sister, not like a king 
and a servant, and I like that. And then finally here, he speaks about um, being like a, a father in verse 11. We dealt with you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you. That fatherliness. And this is speaking about men and women. Wanting to bring that discipline in a good way, that help, that strength, that encouragement, that urging for someone to be everything that God wants them to be. And then finally, I, I could do preach a lot more, but I just want to go to verse 13. And, and all of this, this family-style ministry, as opposed to the other negative things that we saw, all of this was so that in verse 13, they would receive the word of God, not as a human word, but actually as it is, the word of God which is in work at work in you. God's word is not just interesting theology, not just true information about God, the, the state of the world, the past and the future, but God's word, Hebrews tells us, is living, it's alive, it's active. It isn't just information like a philosophy in, in your mind that can, can help you think through things. God's word is living. Jesus said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that is proceeding out of the word of God. When you receive the word, if it's authentic preaching, authentic teaching, reading the word, listening to worship, meditating on the word, that word is nourishing. It's meat. It's milk. It changes. It works. It's supernatural. Jesus said, my words are not just words. My words are spirit. They're life. There's an impartation of God through his word. Of course, the Bible by itself is, is, is of no value, but when the Holy Spirit starts taking and breaking the bread of God's word and opening your mind to God's word, you're not just learning how to live a moral Christian life. You're not just learning about ethics. You're not just learning about theology. You are, you are actually encountering being nourished and strengthened in your inner person and transformation supernaturally is taking place whether you realize it or not every time the Holy Spirit puts you and God's word together. I want to finish with something prophetic that I was thinking about because I've been speaking about that in this passage there's other things I could say but I've said enough that in this passage Paul describes what authentic Christian ministry and leadership is and what authentic Christian leadership and ministry is not. We've looked at that. But in these times, God is speaking to us as a church. A couple of years ago, we had a word of God from an apostolic ministry, Naomi Dowdy, talking about moving into a new era, not just a new season, but a new era. We believe we're seeing signs of that in different ways. And Pastor Peter, uh, I can't remember, quite a few months ago, had, had this word, and he quoted from Isaiah 54, verse 2. He ble believed the Lord was speaking to us as a church, saying, enlarge the place of your tent. We have this on a slide. And let the curtains of your habitations be stretched out. Do not hold back. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. Enlarge the place of your tent and your ministry. I like the, uh, I put this in the uh, amplified Bible version because I, I like the way that this describes it. It's just coming on the slide. There it is. Listen, this is prophetic, we believe. Enlarge the site of your tent to make room for more children. Stretch out the curtains of your dwellings. Do not spare them. Lengthen your tent ropes and make your pegs, stakes, firm in the ground. How do we extend our tent to make room for more children? Well, it's not a new building, is it? We've got quite a few spaces here in this thousand-seater auditorium. So we're not, I'm not about to launch with Pastor Peter a building fund for a new building. We've got space. We're not talking about, we're talking about something spiritual. 
And what we're talking about, enlarge your tent, is this. We need to make room for more people to have authentic Christian ministry. And to make room for more people is not really about a building, but it's about service, servanthood, and taking the next step up in our Christian ministry and leadership. For us to grow, we need more leaders, more servants, and more people that will utilize the gift that God has given them in Emmanuel Church. Because, for example, our life groups, we're going to need a lot more life group leaders. Life groups are our small groups. And of course, you've got training for that, and we give you agendas, but we need, and there's quite a few people in Emmanuel Westminster that have the qualities already to be a life group leader, and we need you because the more people that are joining us, the more different kinds of life groups that we need. Different places geographically for people that want to attend physically. Different life group leaders that will uh, do an online life group like I do one, once a week. We need you to think about, and this is my phrase, God is speaking to some people in our midst to move from being a sheep to a shepherd, all right? a sheep to a shepherd. Sheep are looked after, but there comes a time when a sheep comes to the place of maturity as a Christian sheep where they say, you know, I've been a sheep, I've been well fed, looked after, shepherded, cared for, but now it's time for me to step into a shepherd role, a pastoral role, maybe assisting someone in a life group, maybe stepping out into one of the ministries that are available, not just to receive, but to, to utilize the gifts of God to turn from a sheep to a shepherd so that we can increase our spiritual surface area so that we can look after and raise more people in the kingdom than uh, we even are currently. And my second and final prophetic picture as I was thinking about this is the nets. The nets. Do you remember when the disciples had been fishing all night and caught nothing? And Jesus said, cast out your nets on the other side. They cast the nets out, the nets were filled, but then the nets began to break. When I think about the fish, the fish, Jesus said, you'll be fishers of men. So the fish are the people out there. The fish are out there in the deep, dark ocean of fallen humanity. And when we cast the nets out, to bring those people in, as God brings those people in and God, Jesus speaks the word and the shoals come and the nets are caught. I see that those nets are people, Christians in a church. You're part of our net, I'm part of our net, and when we are stepping out to be authentic Christian ministers in the calling and gifting and abilities that we have here in Emmanuel Church, we are weaving spiritual ropes of relationship, gifting, and service together to create a net that will not only catch fish, but keep fish till we've brought them in, established them, and then those fish, I know the metaphor breaks down, uh, then become ropes themselves. All right, well, that's it. But what we're going to do now is I'm just going to pray for you, and then uh, the worship team are going to come, and we're going to sing that song, Oceans, as we end, and uh, the, the, the famous hill songs, Oceans, is all about Peter stepping out of the boat to where Jesus was, stepping into something new, trusting that Jesus is on the waters with him. And so I hope that many of you will ask God, and in this coming month, we're going to be presenting different ways that you can serve different ministries, and uh, we just want you to be open to the Lord. Nobody needs to run before they can crawl, but uh, just hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to you about putting your roots down here in Emmanuel, but also at the right time, and hopefully that is soon, becoming part of the nets and becoming part of the enlargement so others can also benefit from the gospel. Father, we come to you and we thank you, Lord, for the difference between authentic and inauthentic ministry. Lord, help us to take those analogy of family serious, of being brothers and sisters and nursing mothers and children and, and fathers to, to one another, utilizing our gifts. 
Lord, we want to step out of our boats in different areas of our lives and in ministry to be authentic ministries. Help us to be like Peter, Lord, that dares to step out of the comfort and the security uh, of what we're used to into something new where you are. We're going to stand together right now, sing this song.